Yeah, but um, yeah, the academic market has been tough, I guess, to say the least. And I think that's why your book is really interesting because it sort of talks about sort of a lot of the new pressures that are in coming into play in academic uh, ecosystems. And I think the one, obviously, which is the core part of your book is this idea that we have sort of maybe lost touch with the ability to reason or reason fairly, I think, in academic circles, or we need to get more in touch with that. Well, I think that's that's right, and in, in in the present atmosphere, that's that's a strangely hard sell. Um, I think that that a lot of institutions are are, are pretty desperate, um, the non elite ones, um, without enormous endowments, mm -hmm. um, are are casting about um, trying to find ways to justify their existence. Um, under immense pressure. I mean, just today, the American Association of University Professors released a report on ways in which um, boards um, and administrations have been making an end run around um, you know, well-established rules, rules they have in their own faculty handbook um, mm -hmm. in a kind of panic, both over the pandemic uh, which has merely exacerbated economic concerns mm -hmm. um, that colleges and universities had, and something as abstract sounding as um, let's try to shape people to be reasonable um, is not as alluring um, as cutting liberal arts, liberal education focused programs um, with a view to more vocational um, kinds of programs. And like I said, in, the, in a great rush to do that. Right. Um, Colleges and universities have been um, ignoring um, rules they have um, for employment. Uh, that's not a focus of my book, but just an indication of the kind of pressure mm -hmm. um, that you're talking about. Yeah, and it seems to be very difficult because a lot of the departments, which maybe their reason of being would be to sort of instill a liberal arts education or reasonable qualifications, are sort of declining, as you're saying. Like a lot of the, I guess, the growing fields are more pragmatic minded like in the sense of like their business or STEM related. And that's something which I had joined in my initial couple of years in university. It wasn't really liberal arts focused. And so really the idea that we would be trained in terms of reasonable thought and research was not really um, an emphasized feature. We were supposed to just sort of be able to game the system of multiple choice and understanding balance sheets, but it never spilled through to, I think, more of the classical ideas, which I think you've spoken about, and I know Fritz Zakari and other authors have spoken about in the past about what the purpose of a liberal arts education initially meant, maybe 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, and how that sort of become more commercialized and maybe more pragmatic economically today. Yeah, and, and I think narrower, that is to say that um, the idea of reasonability that I'm looking to put forward. I'm happy to talk more about it. Mm -hmm. um, has an application in, in STEM fields. Um, and, and maybe I'll say a few words about that in a moment, but just to indicate the kinds of pressures that colleges and universities are facing, it's not just that um, boards and administrations are out there looking to cut um, their classics program or looking to cut their English program or at least their major. Um, they're looking to cut physics. Um, they're looking to cut biology. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Because you don't need those majors, right, to have an engineering program. You might need to keep some physicists around right. in order to teach engineering, but you certainly don't need um, a major. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I, I think that what's, although it's certainly true that that STEM is more favored than um, the humanities, um, it, it's nonetheless the case that it's even narrower than that, right? It's more, I need a major like engineering where there's a job engineer, right. <laughs> very, very, very clearly connected. Or accounting, um, or something along these lines. Yeah, and to some extent, I think administrators are responding to mm -hmm. what they see as um, demand, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, how many rear ends do I have in seats um, for this major um, or course? 
And it may be also partly the, the view of the trustees themselves as to what's valuable um, and not valuable. But, you know, when I talk about um, reasonableness, um, I, I have in mind a, a couple of different things, um, both of which, in a way, come from um, John Locke, mm-hmm. um, the 17th century political philosopher. Um, and, and the book really began in my head, and it's the first quotation that I use um, in the book from um, Locke's some thoughts concerning education, um, in which he says there cannot be anything so misbecoming, right? That's an old fashioned word, but it means, you know, inappropriate. Yeah. There cannot be anything so, so misbecoming anyone who pretends to be a rational creature as not to yield to plain reason and the conviction of, of clear arguments. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the first thing to note about that is, is we're talking about a disposition or what we might call a culture mm-hmm. um, that, that guides intellectual work. It, it's not just, just a skill set. Right. right. Which colleges you, Sorry to interrupt, but there was another brilliant quote. I'm not sure if you could repeat it or if you remember it, but it was in the book talking about how sometimes in academic settings, debates focus more on point scoring and winning the debates. And it was a classical philosopher that you had referenced where they sort of esteem someone who's honestly and earnestly in entering an intellectual debate than someone who's sort of interested in winning the debate itself. Yeah, th- th- that is still um, Locke. Um, and, and I don't have that quote at my fingertips, but it occurs in the same section um, of the text uh, fr- from which I'm quoting where Locke is really talking about the just between uh, men of reason, you know, as he puts it, we'd say men and women um, of reason, um, and uh, logical chicaners, right? Uh, deceivers, exactly. basically, um, or people who are merely disputatious, I think is another way um, that it's put. It's an echo of a very old distinction between uh, philosophers on the one hand and sophists on the other. Mm-hmm. And it has to do with aim, right? And and to take it outside the realm of you know the 17th century, we would say, right, that um that, that bullshitters, um and 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 spokespeople and pundits, mm-hmm. right, and so Girl on. Friends. Yeah, yeah, th- these are people who are, yeah, just as much in possession of what we will call critical thinking skills. Mm-hmm. Um, as their opponents, right? That they don't lack for that kind of talent. The, the difference is what they're trying to do. Um, do they consider reason in authority? Are they seeking to improve their understandings, or do they regard it as a tool with which to get the better um, of others? A tool with which to engage in in a kind of combat. The allure of which I don't deny, I, I captained my debate team right back in the day, but it still seems to me that colleges and universities need to be mindful of this distinction. Um, the other thing in, in Locke that I value has to do with, with reasonableness, has to do with the obstacles um, to reasonableness. Uh, you know, he thinks that we're, we're narrow. Um, he's not alone in this, of course, but I, but, but I like the way he puts it, right? We see but in part, and we know but in part, and therefore it is no wonder that we conclude not right mm-hmm. um, from our partial views. And uh, to correct that narrowness, right, uh, what we need is what he calls comprehensive enlargement of mind which I think is a very nice way of putting w- what people are talking about when they talk about liberal arts education, even though we're inclined to say, I think, fairly empty things, like you ought to be well-rounded, right? Uh, Locke's justification points more to a correction of our narrowness, right? He says that we need to listen to the um, opposite arguings, <laughs> Mm-hmm. of men of parts, of talented people, he says that we have to um, learn from the experience of others, even if they're not especially talented. Their experience um, might correct ours. We have to be aware of the limits of um, you know, the, the books that we read, which we're inclined to mistake, right? Right. Um, or the most authoritative ones, 
the sciences that we study because we can have a kind of you know sort of methodological narrowness or a thought that the science that we we know something about mm -hmm. uh, must be the master sciences we can neglect uh, others um, you know, we should read old books as well as new ones because part of our narrowness is narrowness of our time. Mm -hmm. If we can afford it, we should travel because part of our narrowness is the narrowness of place. Um, but what you find is um, in reading uh, both Locke's thoughts concerning um, education, other educational works of Locke, is you start filling in the elements of what we think of as liberal arts education. Again, it's not about you know, attending cocktail parties and impressing people. It's not about being well-rounded, a phrase that, that I, I, I ardently dislike. <laughs> um, it, it's about, you know, correcting for a kind of narrowness that was as evident um, in the 17th century um, as, as it is now. And again, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, th that's not just studying classics um, or the humanities. So that, that's part of it, right? We need to know the limits of the science we study. And that, that argues that for an engineer, we might benefit from mm -hmm. or will benefit um, from um, the kind of uh, studies folks in the humanities and social sciences engage in. Um, you know, but, but that spirit is there in the sciences too, right? In STEM. In fact, in some ways, it's arguably most clearly represented in STEM. Mm -hmm. nowadays right uh, where the idea is that um you know we, we set aside um certain convictions that we have recognize mm -hmm. um that those might be narrow um that were prejudices we, we we're trained to subject um our views to scrutiny right to put our experiments you know how we came to our conclusions out there in public to ignore national boundaries that generally speaking are important to us and uh, try to, and even ignore, I mean, of course we can't, right? Scientists are very ambitious, but we channel that ambition into this um, uh, scientific community with norms that say that we follow the arguments mm -hmm. um, where they lead. So I think it's quite possible to teach um, STEM subjects um, in a spirit of um, right. reasonableness, at least as I've described reasonableness. But it's funny because what you're talking about really, and I think that's why your book is so prescient today, is it goes very much against the zeitgeist of our times, which is that you need intellectual uncertainty, or intellectual uncertainty is probably a healthy sign that you are thinking in a fair way. And in order to have intellectual uncertainty, you sort of probably have to be open-minded. And that sort of goes against this polarization and this polarized nature of political debate, of um, sort of truth-seeking claims today, whether it's about current events, whether it's about Israel-Palestine, which is most recently in the news, um, or it could be about presidential campaigns. It seems to be that this idea that there can be moderation, uncertainty, and middle ground is very limited. As you're saying, like how there's this narrowness in society, it's becoming even more pronounced, I think, today. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, it certainly had an impact on college and university life, mm -hmm. um, polarization, but also a view, um, which you do see um, in the way in which the Israeli-Palestinian debate is being conducted on campus, uh, that uh, openness is it, it's a kind of dithering, right? The suggestion we might not know, that's a kind of dithering, right? right? What's needed is action. Um, so we've seen... A sort of avalanche of statements on the Gaza situation, one of which um, was put out by, I, I want to say they describe themselves as scholars for Palestine or scholars for Palestinian liberation, okay. um, or something like that, in which they explicitly say not just that it, it's acceptable, right, to study, that is, conduct your research, do your teaching. Mm -hmm on the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, um, explicitly politically, right. Understanding that Israel is an apartheid state, mm -hmm. right. That the Palestinians have been wrong. Not only is that acceptable, um, but in fact, it's necessary. It's unacceptable, right. Not to look at the conflict mm -hmm. in that political matter. So, so, so it's an argument against taking a step back. Exactly. And how do you, 
balance that because I think that is such a difficult emotional battle to fight because I think people feel very connected with a lot of these subjects. And the common refrain you hear a lot of times uh, in university or on social media is silence is violence. So it seems like you have to take a political stance. You have to, unless you stand up for a cause, and unless you advocate or articulate an opinion on a cause and you rush to judgments, then you are sort of being a complicit bystander. But that doesn't allow for reflection and thought and deep knowledge. For someone who just walks into an Israel-Palestine debate, you would need probably months and months of reading and research and thoughts and podcast probably to sort of be able to form a relatively familiarized opinion. And yet a lot of people will just sort of share their opinions like off the top of their heads without really making any informed judgment. And that probably goes for most social movements, whether that's Black Lives Matter or maybe um, the Great Recession or whatever it might be, there are probably going to be people who just will instinctively off the cuff, jump to a conclusion without being able to take sort of that natural back step and pause. Yeah, that, that that's a great observation and an important one. And I, I think that what you're dealing with to some extent is, um, I mean, this isn't a term I don't love to use either, but you're, you're dealing with, let, let, let's call it um, a culture, mm -hmm. um, a very broad way of looking at the world, one element of which is um, what's honorable and what's shameful, right? And according to, let, let's call it a culture of activism, mm -hmm. uh, what's honorable is being on the right side of history um, and acting to hasten <laughs> um, the course of history, which is moving in the direction mm -hmm. of justice somehow or another. And what's dishonorable is not to act, right? A as you say, uh, any pretense of neutrality is, is a kind of mm -hmm. um, complicity in things. And so um, I, I think that, that you need um, a counterculture. Right. That is to say that um, at a college or university, right, and uh, you know, pe people don't like this term anymore when it applies at least to um, things other than activism. There really has to be a sense of uh, of shame mm -hmm. at succumbing to propaganda, at refusing to take a step back and clinging to an argument regardless of what evidence mm -hmm. might be raised against it, at refusing um, to participate um, in debate, um, and a, a sense of honor regarding the, the opposite of all those things. Now, you might think that sounds um, impossible, but as I note in the book, as we've just been discussing, this is a model that has been pursued with not inconsiderable success in scientific communities. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's more difficult um, uh, to broaden that out because natural scientists aren't usually dealing with the kinds of issues where we feel strongly that we have to take a stand. But I still think that that model, along with models of, uh, of professionalism, mm -hmm. right, for example, in the legal community, right, uh, where, where even if the prosecutor, right, um, is sure, right, of one thing, the defense attorney is sure of another, right, they have to play their role somehow or another. Exactly. Or in the, in the federal judiciary, right, uh, where you may be deciding a case where the outcome of the individual cases is in some sense inequitable or unjust, but, but, but legally, mm -hmm. right, there's nothing to do about, right, a judge is bound by, by certain constraints, right, honor and dishonor, that runs fairly effectively against the idea that, well, I just have to do something, mm -hmm. right? Um, the life of the mind is like the rule of law um, in that way, and as the federal judiciary is dedicated in some sense or another to the rule of law, the college or university is in some sense dedicated to the, the life of the mind. Um, and I just add that it also has to be rendered attractive, right? It's it's not just shame, mm -hmm. right? A, a case has to be made that 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 it's possible to uh, make progress in disputed matters, mm -hmm. uh, and that it can be a pleasure to do this. Um, I think students do at least sometimes experience that um, in in their classrooms, mm -hmm. um, especially ones who who really aren't sure what to think. 
Um, I, I don't want to eat up too much time with these answers, but if I could just give you give you one example that has to do with the Israeli Palestinian conflict, um, we had a dispute on our campus years ago now. Um, the details of which I, I, I don't need to go into, but I was you know at odds with another professor who felt quite differently than I do mm. um, about the conflict and um, about Zionism and. You know, the way we handled it once the dispute was over is, you know, we, we talked together. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say two things. One, that, that that I think we both enjoyed it and thought we made some progress in the matter. But also, you know, we had a lot of students who came in not sure of what they thought, mm -hmm. especially the ones on the left. They had heard something about Zionism and that they weren't supposed to like it, but they, they still want to know more about it. And I, I think students still... Mm -hmm. want to know things right and and that that can be attractive being in an atmosphere in which you um, have stakeholders um, on both sides you also have people with no dog in the hunt really um, you're in a classroom so there are certain constraints on how you're going to present your arguments you've got a common body of evidence because you're um, doing readings together you're presenting both to people on your own side people on the opposite side and people who might be persuadable um, elsewhere. And um, I, I think there's some power to that experience, especially again to people who don't go in as partisans one way or another. Mm -hmm. But I guess the thing which I struggle with, and I guess it's probably the core audience maybe this book should hopefully speak to, is the departments or the academics or the students who sort of, I think their teachings and their approach is very dogmatic. It almost borders, I think, as someone like John McWhorter would argue almost on this idea of a religious dogma and there's an orthodoxy. And it's very hard to speak to reason, someone who views the world in sort of this binary of you are faithful or you're unfaithful, you're heretical or you are a true believer. And that's where I think your book is so important, but I think it's also very difficult because I think the people who most subscribe to that viewpoint are in these departments which need this reasonable anchor to guide their studies. Yeah, well, you know, I, I talk in the book um, a little bit about that trend um, in the higher education. It, it goes back a longer way, but what what I seize on mm -hmm. um, is the uh, Port Huron statement from 1962. That's um, a statement that comes from Students for a Democratic Society um, in the U.S. Port Huron, Michigan, was where um, it was devised, and um, that statement argues um, that uh, faculty, students of progressive inclination mm -hmm. um, should unite with progressive forces off campus, union organizers and that kind of thing. Um, and the idea is to transform university um, into um, loci for an assault on, I'm, I'm not quoting this exactly, Mm -hmm. uh, oh, for a basis for an assault on the loci of power. That's actually pretty close mm -hmm. um, to an exact quote. So the idea is to to make of the university kind of forward operating base for um, progressive hyphen revolutionary mm -hmm. action. Um, and it's not surprising, right? Because this is basically um, a political ambition that a certain emphasis is placed on on solidarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is not the same as orthodoxy, but can come pretty closely connected to it, right? It's it's more important in some ways mm -hmm. to maintain a united front than um, than carp um, over the details. Um, I think that's a real force um, in universities. Uh, some pieces of the university have that qu quite explicitly in a way at their foundation. Mm -hmm. um, ethnic studies and departments that are connected to that, um, for example. Um, some of these departments are are, are teaching um, uh, what we just discussed, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but it, it makes its way over into all kinds of, uh, you know, political areas of teaching. Things are very much um, uh, hotly contested um, outside of these departments, but not really at all contested within them. So um, I do think that's, you yeah, know, that, that's a real issue. You know, what, what can I say? You know, you, what would be a fool... Um, to deny it um, or its importance. Uh, my argument is that, um, in a way, 
the influence of, of, of those departments and the influence of that model of scholarship, scholarship advocacy, scholar activism, is certainly weaker numerically mm-hmm. um, than one might imagine. Um, there really aren't all that many scholars mm-hmm. um, across American colleges and universities who describe themselves, for example, as on the um, far left. Um, mm-hmm. The departments I've described tend to be relatively small departments with not an enormous amount of strength um, mm-hmm. in the university in, in a lot of ways. Um, but they do, they, they do I think, um, have, have an outsized influence. And my book is in a lot of ways directed toward, t- toward fence sitters, right? I mean, why these departments have an outsized influence? Well, it has something to do with the way universities work and um, who gets drawn to them. Um, so there might be quite a lot of um, people at colleges and universities, you know, maybe even an overwhelming majority, right, who have a stance on what let's call professionalism mm-hmm. um, or, or much wider than that, um, liberal education, right? Um, they may care a lot about those things, but they're not at the university to be activists, right? That's not why they came. They're not there to engage in in political quarrels. They're not there to fight, mm-hmm. right? Um, this relatively small number of people, often sitting, right, in the same department in the same building, who are explicitly there, right, to do something um, to universities, politically speaking. And so, I think the inclination of a lot of us is to kind of, when we see this happening, say, "Well, that's not going on in my department," and to kind of crawl back to their offices and. Right. You know, hope for the best. Um, so, um, I try to argue to you know to, to this group that um, there's more of a problem here than they they might imagine. Mm-hmm. That you really can't turn over right the, the general ed curriculum right, right. Um, to other people and expect um, the reputation of the university to survive, um, or expect that it won't ultimately touch the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, in your own department. And I think that ties into really sort of maybe the underlying or the overt pitch of the book, which is sort of that there's a conservative case for a liberal arts education. I think particularly within certain conservative circles in the United States and as well in Canada, and you mentioned a couple of news outlets like the National Review, Fox News, um, it may become quite popular to sort of um, look down upon university and sort of condemn it and condemn a lot of the ideological excesses. But as you say that there actually is a very core part that conservatives sort of should be attending universities and should be engaging in these intellectual discourses instead of going away from them and running away from these um, ecosystems. Yeah, I I, I think that's right. Um, University bashing, you know, has long been a part of, um, of conservatism and uh you know some of it is warranted right <laughs> um I've, I've certainly written a lot from a conservative perspective about the defects of colleges and universities but um so you know th- th- there is more than one kind of conservatism but one that has a lot of, of power in the united states at least um is the idea that what you're seeking to conserve in conservatism is that you know the principles of the american revolution the principles Mm -hmm. Um, of the founding and to use a kind of shorthand, um, those are enlightenment principles, right? I mean, Jefferson says that the unbounded exercise of reason, right, will serve to strengthen rather than undermine um, the principles of the declaration. So we have a real stake Mm -hmm. in there being, so to speak, a home of reason, right? Um, and, And the universities remain the best candidate for that. So part of my pitch to conservatives that disposition is just that there, there's room to maneuver here, right? Um, it, 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 there are some some real problems which I, which I discuss in the book, but um, there's room to maneuver here. There, there are um, impressive things still going on at universities. Um, you don't hear about them, right? I mean, there, there, there's a whole um, arm of the conservative press dedicated to noticing when an undergraduate you know, write something, you mm-hmm. know, about man spreading, right? They're all over that story, right? But, um, you know, if somebody teaches in another class on Abraham Lincoln and, and Frederick Douglass, you know, that, that doesn't make the news. There's a kind of sensationalism, I think, that um, 
gives us a um, distorted picture of what's going on. So do you, um, think, and, do you think that the public is, or maybe people who would consume more conservative media outlets are getting a heavily or somewhat distorted view of what a modern university campus looks like and a university experience looks like? Yeah, I would say a very distorted view. Um, I mean, it's funny because the story of you, I mean, from a conservative perspective, right, I may think the difference is, you know, are things pretty bad or they're really bad? But I think the conservative view is, you know, if you read outlets like Campus Reform, your view is going to be more or less apocalyptic, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's indoctrination 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I've been inside colleges and universities quite a while now, and um, you know, I, I don't think that holds up um, under scrutiny. I, I, I think that um, I, I quote Larry Summers, right, a, a former president of Harvard, who said, had some real experience with the downsides um, of academic culture, right? And, and he talks about, you know, we now say cancel culture. He uses the term political correctness. He says, well, there is some of that going on. But he says, you know, what, what's going on is mostly what's always gone on, right? Um, students come to college, um, they take classes, most of them don't involve politics, mm -hmm. um, you know, that they, they make friends, they learn things, they get a degree. And he says, if you think that's not most of what's going on at college and university, you have a distorted view of what's going on there. And, and, and I, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I, I've written a lot for conservative outlets about the... Um, defects of colleges and universities. I, I don't want to downplay them, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's easy to get things um, a little bit wrong. I, I want to give you one example um, you know, to speak to another kind of conservative, right? A kind of traditionalist conservative who thinks that in some ways, you know, the, the, the problem is you know, enlightenment and the way which it tends to dissolve traditions and throw us back too much mm -hmm. on our own reasoning resources, right? Traditionalists is inclined to say that, you know, Aristotle and Plato are on life support, you know, at, at, at universities, nobody reads them. But, you know, as I point out in my book, you know, we don't have great data on this. But we have the Open Syllabus Project, which I think, you know, has over a million syllabuses. Is that possible? Probably not. Let's say hundreds and thousands of syllabuses in, yeah. in their database. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they allow you to analyze them a variety of ways. And, you know, who, who's still the most assigned? Well, you know, in the top 10, you've still got Plato. Mm -hmm. You've still got Aristotle's Ethics, Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're a hair behind the Communist Manifesto. Okay, but the Communist Manifesto is quite short. Right. I, I, think that, I think that might explain it more than mm -hmm. um, college university's dedication to Marxism over uh, reading Plato or Aristotle. So, you know, if you're a traditionalist conservative, right, in a certain vein, you, you think that the odds are stacked not just in universities, but in the overall culture against you, right? You've lost every battle. Things are in control, you know, for the progressives. What's one of the relatively few places you might encounter, mm -hmm. right? Some alternative to that. It, it's still at the university. Right. And you cite in one of the chapters, Jonathan Haidt's work with the Heterodox Academy, and there's been a lot of research, I guess, as well with Neil Gross in terms of heterodox opinion within the academy. Um, and is that, a, I guess there are reassuring signs over there in terms of trends, but I guess in terms of when you look probably from what the ac American academic scene looked maybe in the 1950s and 40s, obviously there's been a lot more um, emancip political emancipation and employment emancipation, but in terms of the political diversity, it's become very much skewed. I think maybe increasingly so probably in the 80s and 90s, it really took off exponentially. Is that something which has a detrimental impact? Can that be course corrected? Are there ways in which that it can make a, a more sustainable intellectual environment? Yeah. Um, so I, I think what you're saying is accurate, right? That, that is to say that... Um, yeah, even since I entered college, you know, in the, in the late '80s, mm -hmm. um, you know, colleges and universities have become more lopsidedly left liberal. Mm -hmm. um, so when I entered, for example, I'm not going to remember the the precise numbers, but um, conservatives outnumbered in percentage terms at four year colleges and universities. Um, people who describe themselves as in the far left, you know, by something like three to one. Yeah, and, and now that's even, right? There's been some decline, though not not enormous amount, 
um, among faculty who self-identify as conservatives and a considerable uptick mm-hmm. in faculty who identify as the far left. At the same time, there's been an uptick in faculty who regard themselves as liberal. Um, there's been a shrinking of people who regard themselves as um, middle of the road. So um, all that's true. And if you extended the trend back even further, you, you'd see that um, mm-hmm. college universities uh, look more left liberal um, than they did before. Um, and while that's not the only kind of orthodoxy you can set in the colleges universities, um, that's one kind of orthodoxy you can set in, right? Um, so, you know, if I'm a partisan, um, you know, there are professional standards. They might hold me back. But, you know, if I'm honest about the ways in which prejudice can affect one subtly, right, it might influence what speakers um, I'm really enthusiastic about um, inviting. It might affect what research programs I think are sort of interesting, it might influence what subjects I think that it's worth teaching. It might influence what research results I kind of put a check mark next to as supporting my view and what results I'm going to view um, with skepticism. Right? So I forget who describes the phenomenon, but um, you know, so selective rigor means that if I if I look at a study that contradicts my assumptions, I take a really hard look at it. Right. right? And if I look at a study that doesn't, I I, I don't take a really hard look at it. So the more lopsided things become, uh, the more there's a danger, I I think, of scholarship itself um, becoming lopsided, teaching itself um, becoming lopsided. So I think it's a real problem and very hard to correct Mm -hmm. uh, for for a variety of reasons, right? One reason is that um, just to take, again, I, I mean, politics isn't the only you know important form of this, but just to take politics, which we're already talking about, Conservatives, for for a variety of reasons, um, self-select um, out of colleges and universities, or at least it looks that way. Mm-hmm. It's not that discrimination plays no role, but but there does seem to be some element of self-selection here, such that even if you were trying very hard to attract conservatives to colleges and universities, you might only make so much headway, right? There's what you'd call a pipeline problem here, um, where freshmen entering colleges, universities, right, already, right, in a lopsided way, right, or thinking of going to graduate school or not. Mm-hmm. So um, there's that. Um, so what, what can you do about it? Um, you know, I, I think part of it is um, to, as the Heterodox Academy is trying to do, this wonderful organization, I think, uh, devoted to viewpoint diversity, is reinforce Again, this is very narrow, but it's a useful shorthand. Reinforce professional norms, mm-hmm. right? And you know, again, in a broader sense, of the, the norms I associate with um, uh, with with liberal education. Um, but I know plenty of people, right, who are very progressive, uh, very much on the left, uh, but but who also very much think, right, that um, that scholarship is something distinct. <laughs> Um, from advocacy, um, and, and that is critical to let the arguments and evidence guide you rather than rather than going the other way mm-hmm. um, and letting your conclusions uh, guide the work. Um, I, I think that view is really quite widespread, actually, in academia. In other words, very few people are going to faint, right, when you make that argument. I mean, some people say, no, no, everything's political. You can't make the distinction. It's all about power. But mm-hmm. I, I think not that many academics actually actually hold very hard, uh, if at all, um, to that kind of view. So I, I think what you need to do is sort of activate um, that widespread sense, right? I, I think I say somewhere in the book that, you know, if you mean by us, right, um, those of us who think that um, there's a possibility that's worth reinforcing that... Um, um, one could be reasonable, right? A, a, as something distinct from relying on force or fraud to settle our disputes. Mm-hmm. Right? If that's what us means, people who think that that proposition is, is, is plausible and worth pursuing, I think there are more of us than there are of, of them, right? Those who <laughs> would hold the opposite view. So, so you, you need to somehow or another activate that. And that's really part of the purpose of my book. I mean, my book is directed to a lot of constituencies, but one of them is this constituency I've described as people who don't really feel they have a dog in the hunt exactly. 
Right. right? They, they may have all kinds of views, but they're not necessarily going to leap into a public forum um, and defend them. Because they think they're fine, right? They can maintain those views in their department or among their friends or in their labs or, or something like that. And um, I, I think that one needs to um, activate that viewpoint. Yeah, and I think the book makes a very strong case for the need for more reasonable thinking and reasonable teaching practices. In terms of like practical, concrete steps, are there certain policies that you would recommend? Is this a structural issue which has to come from high-level administrators? Is this something which is a cultural phenomenon, which maybe has to be changed slowly throughout teaching culture and academic culture? Like, What would be if there are two or three major initiatives or to-do points that could be resolved? What would you put over there? Well, uh, you know, it, it, uh, there's a student side and the faculty side. I, I think it's largely um, a cultural issue. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be affected um, by um, uh, by administrations. Um, so certainly part of what would be on my to-do list is a more forthright um, statement of purpose, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, on the part of... Um, college and university administrators. Um, and, and there are a couple of ways. I, I guess I'll focus right now on administration, but I don't think, don't think it's the sole focus. So th- there are a couple of ways um, in which this works. Right. One way is that a lot of the teaching, well, that's an exaggeration. Some of the teaching that goes on at colleges and universities, you know, it comes from administrators, right? People in the residence halls are, are engaged in teaching, mm-hmm. right? Uh, about microaggressions, for example about social justice, about diversity, equity, inclusion, right? These are basically student-facing administrators who are carrying out an educational program. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, these student administration, we've talked a little bit about um, where um, faculty are on the political scale, but we don't know too much about this, but but, but there's good reason to believe that student-facing administrators, right, the ones likely to be in places like residence life are, are considerably more liberal than even the faculty, mm-hmm. right? Um, so th- th- there may be even more lopsidedness in those kinds of programs um, than one sees um, in, you know, in whatever faculty um, have charge of, especially because they're, they're less likely to be constrained by um, professional norms. There aren't, there aren't exactly professional student-facing administrator norms exactly. that speak to things like academic freedom or inquiry or the pursuit of the truth, right? Um, but, but the wonderful thing about that, in a way, right, the opportunity presents is that these student-facing administrators do answer, right, um, in, in a way that, that faculty don't exactly, mm-hmm. right, to administrators. So I think there's a way in which administrators can really set a tone. Mm-hmm. Right uh, for the administrators who work under them. Now, many of these administrators, I, I, the student-facing ones, um, I, I, I don't in any way mean to belittle them. They're, they're not necessarily there to, you know, go on a long march to the institutions, as we say. Many of them are attracted to something about college life, right? And, and th- there's a very good chance, certainly the, the, the student-facing administrators I know, um, that they have some real affinity for these other things I've described. They may not have the professional norms, but they have an affinity, right? Right, for things they encountered, right, at college, university have to do with the pursuit of the truth. These things can be activated, right? right? But it takes some leadership um, from the top. And then the other element, as I said, is um, how you present yourself both internally and externally. Colleges and universities are increasingly putting forward core value statements. Mm-hmm. Right, I think they actually got this from the corporate world somewhere, um, and they, they tend to be, they're not always, but they tend to be sort of undifferentiated lists of things that the university wants to do. So, you know, mm-hmm. you know we're, we're sustainable, and we're equity-minded, and we like excellence, and, you know, maybe inquiry is somewhere on the list, right? right? But um, yeah, on the one of 10 values, or maybe it isn't, right? I mean, may, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. But, um, but um, you know, it, it needs to be central, mm-hmm. 
right? And um, so, so I think that that's, again, something over which you know, administrators, faculties, and trustees all have some control. They tend to craft these statements together. And so, you know, a, a university is a lot of things, right? And it's not all one thing, right? So, you know, I, I think what's central to universities is, is inquiry into the truth, transmission of Mm -hmm. uh, of what we know um, to students and so on. That doesn't mean that we don't do other things, right? We have human resources departments. They have to make decisions about how to treat employees. We have physical plants. They have to make decisions about how they're going to relate to the environment. Mm -hmm. But when we're thinking about what our values are, we have to think about things that are distinctive to the institution, mm -hmm. right? Again, the federal judiciary is one kind of institution. College and university is at least potentially another kind of institution. And, and what we say about ourselves, both when we're talking to each other, mm -hmm. because core value statements are internal documents, and when we're talking to the public, because core value statements are also often facing externally as well, mm -hmm. right? we're saying something about uh, who we are and, and, and what we do. Mm -hmm. And I guess as a last question, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but what would you, what are your thoughts towards the idea of sort of like an academic affirmative action for intellectual diversity? Is that an idea that you like? Is that something which sort of offends your sensibilities? What, what do you think about maybe that as a way of equalizing intellectual diversity and downstream from that having more reasonable and open-minded debate on campuses? Yeah, I've thought about this some, and I, I've changed my mind on it ever so slightly um, in the course of thinking about it. So there's a wonderful book um, by um, Joshua Dunn and John Shields called Passing on the Right. Mm -hmm. It came out, I think, a few years ago, maybe 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does quite wonderfully, I think, is um, it, it, it looks in some depth, you know, their, their method is basically interview. They also do some survey work at the experience of conservative professors in, in universities. And, and kind of like, 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 like my argument, but in a very different way, um, they conclude that things are, are pretty bad, but not as bad as, as some conservatives say there. I guess it's one reason I like the book, right? You tend, <laughs> tend to like stuff where um, uh, I, I have a weakness for having my preconceptions affirmed too, I suppose. But um, uh, it's nonetheless quite, quite well done, and I, I'd, I'd recommend it. It's worth reading right after you get my book. You can get that book. But the, um, the, um, one of the things they say in the book is that most conservatives don't want affirmative action, right? In part because they, they really take a line against, um, against affirmative action. Um, you know, I, I would say that, um, and I mostly took that line too, right? No affirmative action. I mean, I, I think that that's, that's uh, you know, not a good way of going about um, one's, one's business for the, the reasons conservatives say, you know, usually isn't. But right. um, I, I, I do think that, that, and this is where I've changed my mind a little bit that, um, you know, departments do care about diversity of, of various kinds. Right. Um, so I, I might be concerned about, um, you know, do I have enough regional coverage? Right. I've got Asia. Do I have Africa? Right. For example, if, if I'm running, you know, a program that has an international um, mm -hmm. component, um, I've got somebody who does quantitative stuff. Um, do I have somebody who's working on the non-quantitative side? I've already got an Americanist. Do I have a political theorist? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And, and so I, I think the more you, you imagine, and I think this is a sensible thing to imagine, that our, our sense of politics can affect, you know, as I said, I'm not going to repeat it, but I'll just repeat a couple of things. What areas of research we think are important? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what kinds of things I think it's important to teach? Then it might not be bad to think something to affect of, right? If, I, if I'm thinking about bringing somebody onto the faculty, uh, perhaps they ought to bring in somebody who disagrees with me about this stuff. Right. Right. So, so I, I describe it not not as sort of a, a, a institutional program, but more as a way in which departments might think about it. Right. Um, as kind of a little plus factor, right, among many other small plus factors. I don't think it would have a lot of impact. But you know, m most programs um, I know of, right, when they're doing a job search, you've got the people in the department who are doing the search, and then usually there is at least one person outside the department. 
right? And and they don't usually exercise very much of the influence they could potentially have. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one question that somebody from the outside department might raise. You know, aren't you bringing in somebody who sort of takes the same line you do, right, um, on various issues, some of which uh, might be political issues? I, I think that that might be worth doing. But I think the more important thing is is, is cultural, you know, as almost always, at least in my argument, where you know, faculty, you know, they, they do have, I think, you know, sort of intellectual slash scientific consciences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that most of my colleagues do understand that there's something strange about being alive to the way in which prejudice might unconsciously affect us in every other area, right? Um, except for our politics, even when we're teaching, right, subjects with political resonance about which we deeply care. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I think that there's that, um, you know, you, you talked before about um, a value I try to place on, on what we don't know, our humility or knowledge of our own ignorance. And, you know, one aspect of that, which, you know, I, I think progressives have drawn our attention to is that, um, you know, we can be influenced by um, prejudices. Even we kind of think, well, I'm a professional, right? I'm not. Right. Um you know that 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 works up to a point. It's very important. I think it, it's more effective than many people imagine that it is. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have to be alive to to your prejudices. I mentioned in the book that um, you know, when you ask um, professors why aren't there more conservatives, right? The most common answer is, well, you know, they're closed-minded and they like money. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, as if that's not right. A, a, a kind of. Um, stereotype, which, you know, I mean, might, might or might not be borne out, right, by looking at why um, conservatives don't go into academia, but that, that's kind of the starting point. You know, it's clearly you know, right. um, a prejudice. So so we, we need to think more about the ways in which we're, we're prejudiced, not just with respect to race, gender, and all the rest of that, but also um, politics. And by the way, I, th I think it wouldn't be bad. Um, universities now increasingly, even in terms of you know, what you have to do when you apply to a job or saying, you know, you have to talk about diversity. And I, I really think it wouldn't be bad if colleges and universities, you know, said that intellectual diversity is one of the kinds of diversity we care about. That doesn't mean that you're, you're confusing two things that, you know, that, that conservatives plight is as bad as the plight, right, of a um, historically marginalized group. Um, it, it just means that this is something that we care about that's fundamental right. <laughs> um, to, to, to our mission. So, so I think that the resistance to including that, I think, doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, amazing, Professor. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I had a great time speaking with you. And we'll plug the book and we will put all the show notes together with all the links uh, promoting your book and everything like that. But it was an amazing book. I just finished reading it or rereading it yesterday. And really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. Well, 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 tell a friend, I'm still waiting. This was called Speakeasy. I expected to receive some hooch in the mail that I drank uh, <laughs> while we were talking. But um, it's pro pro probably coming late. It's coming. It's coming. It's down the pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks Amazing. so much, Ari. I, I did enjoy this. And, um, you know, you've got, got a good thing going here. Thank you so much, Professor. We'll be in touch. Stay safe. And all the best. You too. All right. Have a good one. You too.